consciousness changes completely once it starts to include other minds. If wakefulness is about noticing the world, no central brain at all. Next step is caring about what you've noticed. It's not just detected, it's judged. From just reacting or adapting to being intentional. Every conscious mind I've ever met, human, animal, maybe even artificial, runs on the same handful of building blocks. The only difference is how they are arranged. So far in this series, we've been pulling apart the idea that consciousness is just an on and off switch. It's not a ranking chart, not a strict ladder you climb. Think of it more like five key abilities, functions that can show up in different ways, in all sorts of minds. We are not trying to solve consciousness here, not in a big philosophical sense at least, but this gives us a sharper way to look at it, to ask better questions about what a system actually does and what that might tell us. And most importantly, it gives us a way to think about something much harder to pin down, the true feeling of being here, of having an inner life, and how it might grow out of much simpler parts. Group 1 wakefulness and awareness. It's basically the on switch, just being tuned in enough to register the world in some way, even if there is no thought, no memory, no emotion involved. It's reactivity, orientation, sensory openness. If a system can notice change and respond, even a tiny bit, that's already miles away from just sitting there and doing nothing. From an evolutionary point of view, this shows up very early. Even the simplest life forms benefit from detecting light, motion or touch and changing their state in response. It's the very first step toward interaction, the very first step toward survival. And here is the thing, you don't even need a brain for this. The plant, Mimosa pudica, can fold its leaves in under a second when touched, all triggered by changes in internal pressure, no neurons involved. In animals, you see it in reflexes, in sleep-wake cycles, in constant sensory scanning. Some fish can shift their arousal levels before a threat arrives, and jellyfish, no central brain at all, still show sleep-like states with clear behavioral rhythms. What counts in this group? Reactivity, responding to basic stimuli, sensory discrimination, telling different inputs apart, environmental orientation, adjusting to what's around you, arousal regulation, shifting between alert and restful state. On its own, this doesn't necessarily mean conscious experience, but it lays the groundwork. You can't feel something if you don't register it. You can't reflect on anything if there is nothing coming in. Wakefulness is the baseline, the doorway every other function has to pass through. Group number two, affective experience. If wakefulness is about noticing the world, the next step is caring about what you've noticed. That's where affective experience comes in. The ability to feel things as good or bad, safe or dangerous, pleasant or painful. It's the point where raw information turns into something meaningful. It's not just detected, it's judged. From an evolutionary standpoint, that's a massive upgrade. If you can feel pain, you avoid injury. If you can feel hunger, you go find food. Emotional signals let you react faster and more flexibly than reflexes alone ever could. And it's not just a vertebrate thing. Cephalopods, octopuses, cuttlefish, squid show surprisingly complex emotional processing. In one experiment, octopuses avoided a chamber that had been linked to mild pain, but later, when scientists paired that same chamber with a local anesthetic, the octopuses started seeking it out, because they now associated that space with a relief. They weren't choosing pain, they were choosing to feel better, which means they remembered the discomfort, noticed the contrast, and acted differently because of it. Affective experience doesn't require language or self-reflection, but once pain and pleasure enter the picture, the system starts to care about what happens next, and that changes everything. What counts in this group? Pain and pleasure indicators, avoidance of harm and seeking of reward, stress responses, emotional learning tied to fear or reward, 
These aren't just basic reactions, they are weighted experiences. A system with effect doesn't act just because something happened, it acts because it mattered. Group 3. Learning and memory. If effect gives experience value, then memory gives it direction. This is the capacity to learn from what happens and actually use that knowledge later. It's what lets a conscious system go beyond pure reflex and instinct to change its behavior based on what it's been through. Memory is what links the past to the present. Learning takes those experiences and turns them into guidance. Together, they give consciousness depth. It's no longer just a moment in time, it's a story that is still being written. From an evolutionary point of view, that's a huge advantage. If an animal remembers where it found safe shelter, which plants taste good, or which actions got it hurt, it doesn't have to figure those things out from scratch every time. It can adapt, and you don't need a big brain for this. Bees can learn to recognize colors and patterns linked to sugar water, even solve simple mazes. In one experiment, bees learned to pull a string to get a reward, and other bees picked it up just by watching. What counts in this group? Associative learning, linking one thing to another, long-term memory, flexible behavior, goal-directed adaptation. A system with memory starts to develop a kind of history, not necessarily a story it can tell, but an internal record that shapes how it acts and how it feels. Learning and memory give consciousness a personal dimension. Not just being aware, but being changed by what you've experienced. Group 4. Social cognition. Consciousness changes completely once it starts to include other minds. This capacity, social cognition, is about more than just noticing movement or sound. It's about recognizing that there is someone behind it, an agent with their own goals, thoughts and feelings. Evolution built this into social animals because survival in group means more than finding food. It means coordinating, trusting, competing and knowing who you can rely on. This shows up in a whole range of ways. Imitation, deception, communication, shared attention, even empathy. Take crows. In a famous study, some crows watched a human hide food. Days later, when that same human came back, the crows changed their behavior, moving their stashes when they knew they'd been watched. It's not just memory, that's strategy. They were modeling what another being knew and acting on it. Or dolphins working in perfect sync to hunt, copying human gestures, even swapping roles mid-cooperation without missing a beat. In humans, this capacity grows in stages. Babies start by following a caregiver's gaze, then they learn joint attention, that you can both be looking at the same thing, together. Later still, they begin to grasp fairness, deception and empathy. What counts in this group? Social imitation, copying another's action, joint attention, sharing focus, perspective tracking, keeping track of what others know or see, deceptive or cooperative behavior, acting with intent toward others. Social cognition adds a whole relational layer to consciousness. Once you can model other minds, you are no longer just navigating the environment, you are navigating intentions, reactions and meaning. And in system with strong social cognition, awareness stops being solitary, it becomes shared. Not entirely, but enough that it starts to look a lot like empathy. Group 5. Metacognition and selfhood. Finally, we turn inward. Metacognition and selfhood are about being able to step back and look at your own mind, to notice your thoughts, keep track of how you're feeling, and hold on to a sense of who you are. This is the point where consciousness doesn't just process information, it knows it's processing. Put simply, it's thinking about thinking. In humans, this capacity develops slowly. A toddler will cry when they're hungry or laugh when they're tickled, but only later will they say, I am upset or I want to be a doctor when I grow up. That's the self-model kicking in, a version of you that stretches across time. And it's not uniquely human. Great apes, dolphins, elephants and even magpies have passed versions of the mirror test. 
though scientists still debate how much that really proves. But metacognition goes beyond mirrors. Orangutans, for example, have been seen planning their travel routes a day in advance. In humans, it can grow into full-on introspection, a personal life story and long-term goal setting. What counts in this group? Self-recognition, planning and foresight, internal state monitoring, narrative self-concept. This is what takes a conscious life from just reacting or adapting to being intentional. A mind with metacognition can look ahead, imagine possibilities and place itself in a timeline. Not every mind gets here, but for the ones that do, this is what turns simple presence into a full-blown personhood. Looking at consciousness through function gives us structure without oversimplifying. Each group, from wakefulness to selfhood, describes a different capability. None explain consciousness alone, but together they show how complex minds might form, piece by piece, and they help us see how inner life might emerge from function. Not just input-output, but feeling, memory, recognition, intention. These aren't abstractions, their science system is not just reacting, but experiencing. That's why this framework matters. It's not about drawing hard lines over what is or isn't conscious. It's about noticing the signals, the layers, and thinking more carefully about what they might mean. If this resonated, consider subscribing or leaving a comment. It helps more than you might think, and it tells me how this framework is landing.